Um, my name is Rohit Prasad. I'm from the company Proton Motor Fuel Cell. Some of you may know us. We've been in the industry for a very long time. But uh, I'll start off by just giving a... I stay on stage because of the live streaming. Oh, I see. I'm on <laughs> camera. Um, so I'll start off with a presentation of my company. Uh, we are located in a city called Puchheim near Munich. We have been developing hydrogen fuel cell technologies starting back in 1994 when we began our development um, underneath the umbrella of a company called Magnet Motor. And in 1996, we decided, okay, fuel cells is a very specific application and requires its own um, um, research development. So in 98, we split off and founded the company Proton Motor. Today, we are about 75 employees and uh, we develop low temperature PEM hydrogen fuel cell systems. If you've ever heard of fuel cells being used in cars or buses or trucks, mobile applications essentially, then you're most likely have heard of PEM technology and that's the technology that we develop. Um, our applications, our market is very widespread, so we're active in stationary applications, we're active in mobility applications, and today I'll be presenting a project that we did actually in the maritime application, which uh, is a new market, so to speak, and can be a very interesting market for fuel cells in the future. So what we do is our core know-how, our core competence lies in the production development um, of fuel cell technology. Now, fuel cell systems can roughly be divided into two levels, so to speak. Uh, the stack level, which you see on your left-hand side here, where the reactions actually take place. This is the heart, the core of a fuel cell system. And then every stack requires its own balance of plants, so its own auxiliary components for safety, for proper operations, and there's always a, uh, a back and forth between the, the fuel cell stack and the balance of plant. A fuel cell stack has a unique signature, so to speak, that allows it to function properly only when it's put in combination with the right fuel cell system components. And this entire loop, so to speak, is part of our know-how. We are one of the few, I think, on the market that start at the core development of the stack, followed by the development of the system, and then we have other layers of integration that uh, I'll go over in this presentation. So when we began working on fuel cell systems about 20, 22, three years ago, um, you could say that there was not enough experience on the market for us to hand over fuel cell tasks, let's say, to partners. So we began from the very beginning. Yeah? We began with the dimensioning of the fuel cell system, the dimensioning of the battery system, the entire powertrain, followed by, of course, the stack manufacturing, design, integration, and we also we did at the time, and now we do as well, integrate the entire fuel cell system into vehicle platforms, or stationary applications, or ships, or trains. Um, in the future, we, as the production numbers go up, as the market starts to pick up, our goal would be to pull ourselves back to the pure research, development, and manufacturing of the fuel cell stacks and systems. A little bit about our history, so for the first roughly 16, 20 years of our existence, we would like to say that we were more or less a research and development organization. We've invested a lot of money, a lot of time, a lot of resources into developing our fuel cell technology. And we've tested our fuel cell technology in multiple applications over the years, uh, many of them being first of a kind. So we had, uh, to my knowledge, the first fuel cell forklift operating in Munich Airport. Um, we even had the first, uh, I believe, first in the world triple hybrid bus uh, focused on fuel cells, batteries, and ultracapacitors. We had, of course, the first uh, maritime application in Germany and perhaps all in Europe uh, in 2008. That's the project I'll talk about today. And uh, we've had applications for autonomous energy, energy, seasonal energy storage, mobility, all across the board. Um, Today we'll focus on maritime though. So this is the project we did in Hamburg in 2008, 2007. Uh, this is a passenger ferry with about 100 passengers on board. We wanted to demonstrate that fuel cells, hydrogen, batteries, so clean emissions or zero emissions and clean energy is possible also in the maritime. 
And in this project, we were responsible for, for dimensioning the fuel cells, dimensioning the batteries, the hydrogen storage, um, of course, developing the fuel cells themselves. We did not develop the batteries or the hydrogen storage, but we did design this entire powertrain. And we also integrated the powertrain with our partners into the system, or into the ship back then. Now, of course, this was a project 10 years ago. It was a demonstration project. We wanted to show that the technology is viable for this market. And today, this market seems to be picking up once more. So if you, if you take a look at the market today, there's two things that I would like to focus on. So every customer that has in mind, so of course, cost is one. And safety is another issue when you install hydrogen and fuel cells on board a vessel. So I'll focus on those two. Starting with cost, we've been saying for over 20 years now that the best way to implement a fuel cell into any application is a hybrid system, fuel cells and batteries. The, the entire power or energy required by a powertrain does not need to come entirely from a fuel cell, but it can always be and should, in fact, always be a combination of fuel cells and batteries to get the best cost and to get the best efficiencies. So we start always by looking at, um, let's say, the, the operating profile of a vessel or a vehicle. Yeah, we always start by looking what is the power requirement of the vessel and, and how does that play over, over the operation period. And from this requirement, we can then start dimensioning how much energy needs to come from hydrogen and how much energy needs to come from batteries. Since hydrogen and fuel cells today, and even back then, tend to be slightly pricier than batteries, your goal, or our goal, let's see, is to, to minimize the size of the fuel cell while at the same time achieving the customer's requirement. So we install the minimum, absolute minimum capacity of fuel cells and batteries um, in order to reach the goals, but also to optimize for cost. So, uh, like I said, back then, uh, we, we, we took more or less the entire powertrain into our hands. We, we started with the power demand, as I just mentioned. Uh, we, we dimensioned the systems, the fuel cells, the batteries, and the hydrogen storage systems based on the vessel profile. And uh, following that, we did a packaging study, so to speak. How do we integrate all of these components into a ship? Yeah? That was followed, of course, by the manufacturing and then the integration that was done on board. Uh, the integration then followed by commissioning, also done with our help and under our supervision. And then followed by certification, which is also a very important issue in this market. Coming to the question of electrical integration. So what you're seeing here is more or less is simply pretty standard electrical powertrain. What we always say is you can, you can simply add on your fuel cell, your modular fuel cell systems, onto the main DC bus through DC-DC converters. Now, that box on the left, what you're seeing, the fuel cell box, so to speak. Now, there's many different options in how you implement this. Um, the most simple option, of course, is to have one stack with one balance of plant connected to an electrical train, powertrain, with a DC-DC converter. But when we start looking at very high power ranges or very high power requirements, megawatt scale and so on, there are different solutions that come to mind. For example, what we're working on currently, multi-stack solutions. What that means is we have uh, a number of multiple stack modules all being serviced by one balance of plant or one air supply, a centralized air supply, for example, and a centralized cooling supply, for example. Um, what that does is, of course, it reduces costs, it increases the efficiency of the system, and we believe that that is the way to go to address the very large power requirements. Safety, of course, is another issue. Now you have to make sure that there's no hydrogen leakages involved. Um, you also have to make sure that the proper X zones are defined. So X zone is areas where you can have an accumulation of hydrogen uh, under normal operations, and you have to make sure that the hydrogen pipes, for example, have to be double-walled. The hydrogen pipes have to be inerted with nitrogen gas so that there's no danger of hydrogen accumulating. Um, we have three levels of safety. Let's say the first is simply a software safety. If any of the parameters of the system fall outside acceptable levels, there is an emergency or a safe, a safe shutdown procedure. That followed by a hardware circuit safety level, again, 
if any of the system parameters fall outside, defi fall outside defined uh, areas, we can have a safe shutdown. And the last one, of course, pressure relief devices. So to simply, in the worst of all cases, to simply release hydrogen into a safe area outside the vessel or ship. Um, you're seeing here a cross-section of the ship. We have the battery room here, hydrogen storage, and the fuel cell operating system. Now, there are certain special requirements for the rooms themselves, for the installation areas themselves. Um, some of them developed by us. Some of them have been around for a while. This, again, is a project we did 10 years ago, but a lot of what we learned from that project applies even today and will, no doubt, be a requirement for future vessels using hydrogen and fuel cells. This is a cross-section of the ship. Again, uh, you can see here batteries, hydrogen, and fuel cells. We had about 50 kilograms of hydrogen stored on board. Um, we had a 50 kilowatt fuel cell system as well, and that allowed us to operate for eight hours a day uh, for three days in a row without refueling. Well, let's say you had to refuel once every three days, um, which turned out to be perhaps too good of an idea because what happened with this project is somewhat of a bittersweet story. It operated perfectly fine for four to six years, I believe, but since we happened to be the only customers for the hydrogen refueling station, it wasn't much of a business case for the hydrogen refueling operators. So after a lot of discussion, they decided to take away the fuel cell, sorry, the, the, the hydrogen refueling station, and now we have a ship that has no hydrogen. Well, still, the learning and the experience that we have from that project is more valuable than any of this. Um, so, what, what is the outlook for Proton Motor? I mean, why are we in the hydrogen business, of course? The, the, well, the idea of the hydrogen economy is not necessarily a new one. Yeah? It's, it's been around for more than 30 years. The idea was to replace the current uh, hydrocarbon economy with a cleaner, emissions-free hydrogen economy. But a lot of things have changed in the last 30 years. Today, what we believe is the main driving force for hydrogen is renewable energies. So there is absolutely no doubt that the production of renewable energy is going to increase in coming years. And with that production comes the challenge of storing excess energy, of transporting excess energy, and, and really at its core, hydrogen is simply an energy carrier. All it is is a way to store and transport and then reuse renewable energy. So, again, for us, the future outlook is, is, is somewhat, you could say, hooked onto the wagon of renewable energies. Yeah, Proton Motor, we've been around for a very, very long time, and we start to see that the market is now really starting to develop. One of the key pushes being, again, uh, increase of renewable energy production across Europe. And with that, I'll stop. Um, thank you. I wish... Uh, if there are any questions? Thank you very much, Roy Prasad. Um, are there any questions from the audience right now? Okay, if not, I have a question. You said you've learned a lot from the project, from Absolutely. the Maritime project. Could you maybe share one or two learnings out of it? Sure. Well, the first thing I would say is always dimension your hydrogen refueling station properly. So um, I think the original story with this station was it was also meant for hydrogen trucks and buses that operate in the same area. But uh, if I'm not mistaken, it turned out that they built another hydrogen refueling station somewhere else. And it turned out again that the station was overdimensioned for one vessel. So that's really a key point to take away. Um, and with your last slide or second last slide you showed us, where are you heading with Prodan Motors? So I don't see the maritime application um, so much anymore. Is this? Absolutely. So well, we come out of mobility. Yeah. Our technology is focused on mobile applications and on stationary energy applications as well. But what you see here is a stack module from Proton Motor. And, and, and the same stack module, the same technology, can be used for any kind of energy okay. application. And it just so happens that maritime and also rail are the new upcoming markets, in my view, for hydrogen fuel cells. Thank you very much for your time. Give him a big hand of applause for your first presentation of this year's Technical Forum. Thank you. Um,